Hey, it's Talk Gnosis. We're welcoming back to the show your parasocial best friends, parasocial guru. You know him from podcasts like Hinge Points, Hell of Presidents, Time for My Stories, and Frost, uh, Frost Christman, and his new podcast, Hell on Earth. Matt Christman, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. Uh, Matt, you spent uh, almost a year working on this new podcast about the Thirty Years' War. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We're uh, we're finishing up the last episodes now. It should be out in January. Okay, amazing, amazing. So uh, a whole year's uh, work, uh, a whole year of content, just to talk about this this very complex. Uh, 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 th- th- this complex situation. Matt, can you yes. tell, us what, the, <laughs> you tell us what the Thirty Years' War is in about five minutes? Uh, well, it's it was uh, the breakup, really, of the Holy Roman Empire as an uh, as a effective political unit. Uh, the, the early modern period is this time when, uh, in this these conditions of uh, rapid destabilizing uh, economic and 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 ecological. Uh, and social and cultural factors, uh, you see the the, the uh, these dynasties uh, uh, begin to assert themselves as uh, capable of governing uh, these these geographic areas, and and uh, finally begin to overawe the uh, the the noble classes of these these different uh, dynastic regions. Uh, and you see that happen in Spain and France and in, in the England and also uh, in the uh, Holy Roman Empire. Uh, but the difference between those and the rest is that the polity of Germany uh, just simply is not capable of being centrally uh, uh, controlled. And the centrifugal forces unleashed by this period basically pull it apart. And the Holy Roman Empire, uh, the Thirty Years' War, is sort of the last as- uh, attempt uh, by the Habsburg dynasty to assert a actual uh, a governing control uh, over this this region. And after it's over, uh, with the Treaty of West, the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, uh, the Holy Roman Empire persists. It persists until Napoleon, but Germany uh, sort of is uh, knocked out of the running, I guess you'd put it, uh, in the competition among these medium-sized states uh, in in Western Europe for for preeminence. Uh, And it's that battle for preeminence that's going to lead to the emergence of uh, uh, capitalism uh, in in low countries and then in in England. And the Thirty Years' War is really the story of why uh, in the place that is sort of the most uh, urbanized, the place that is as the most uh uh has the most population has the the greatest um uh dynamism in this economy uh germany is is sort of uh incapable of fulfilling that role uh and it's uh and it all starts in uh bohemia which is a a a part of the holy roman empire where and the only kingdom within it uh where the uh P- protestant bohemian elites uh, reject the Holy Roman Emperor as their sovereign, and uh, invite Frederick V, the only Calvinist elector of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, to become their king. And in so doing, kicks off thirty years of horrific bloodshed, uh, in which both sides imagine themselves to be trying to assert uh, a uh, a religious settlement uh, on the land that will lead, in everyone's mind, to uh, he- to uh, Christ's return and to heaven on earth. And instead, uh, they created, uh, as we're calling the podcast, Hell on Earth. Yeah. And uh, for people at home, it's uh, just read the Wikipedia article, right? Then come yeah. back, watch the show. But literally millions and millions and millions and millions of people died, right? Like this this was, uh, like you're saying, Hell on Earth, it, it must have felt like the end of the world. And people are, are kind of wondering why... Why are we talking about this on the show now? You know, I'm I'm middle aged. When when you get to your your middle ages, you uh, you either if you're a person like me, you either become like a Napoleon guy or a <laughs> World War II guy or like a Holy Roman Emperor uh, Empire uh, Habsburg guy, right? But that that's yeah. not why I'm doing the show. We're going to be talking about the Rosicrucians. That the mm-hmm. Rosicrucian 
legends, the actual Rosicrucian groups come out of this time. Uh, we've done a lot of programming about Rosicrucianism on this show. It's it's not Gnostic in the second century uh, version of the of, of the tradition, but it's something that becomes very important later on for feeding into what becomes Gnostic movements, the Gnostic church that I'm part of. So it, it, this is a, a really great way to take a look at its origins. And just like Matt was saying, uh, the early Rosicrucianism, all Rosicrucianism has this utopianism in it, right? The mm -hmm. the building of of the perfect society. So so Matt, what what role did the Rosicrucians, if they existed, the legends of the Rosicrucians, the paranoid conspiracies about the Rosicrucians, what what role did they did they, did they play in this uh, uh, this conflagration? Uh, well, I, whatever comes later, and honestly, you know way more about what Rosicrucianism becomes in the aftermath of Thirty Years' War than I do. And honestly, I'd be interested to hear some more some of uh, what happens uh, after our, like my focus on it. Uh, but it begun begins it sweeps Germany uh, thanks to uh, the circulation first in manuscript form and then in uh, 1614 uh, in printed pamphlet form of uh, uh, two, beginning with two uh, anonymously uh, written pamphlets. The first one called the Fama Fraternitatis or the discovery of the fraternity of the most noble order of the Rosy Cross. Uh, and these appear in bookstalls in Germany uh, at the same time that uh, the Holy Roman Empire is reaching a, a real crisis point uh, of legitimacy. It, the Holy Roman Emperor can no longer credibly stand as an adjudicator between the, the different sects and the different uh, regions and the different religious confessional camps within the, the empire anymore. He, uh, it is increasingly seen by Protestants as uh, a advocate for and, and the, the leader of the Catholic camp within the empire and as such, someone uh, that they have to uh, consider not their sovereign, but rather uh, an enemy, uh, the, the threat to them. Uh, and uh, I mean, and at this, so you've got by this time the uh, Protest the, the Protestant Union has been uh, created uh, among the uh, Protestant princes, uh, spearheaded by Frederick V of the Palatinate, and the uh, Catholic League is formed in response. Uh, head, uh, spearheaded by Maximilian of Bavaria. Uh, and there is a, a growing sense that some sort of confrontation, some sort of holy uh, war is going to emerge. And in this ferment comes this pamphlet, this series of these two pamphlets, uh, one uh, sort of back-to-back. Uh, -back. The second one is called uh, the Confessio Fraternitatis, or the Confession of the Laudable Fraternity of the Most Honorable Order of the Rosy, Rosy Cross, written by all the learned of Europe. Uh, and the first one is uh, written in German. The second one is in Latin for a more uh, educated and uh, 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 esoteric audience. Uh, and the uh, the gist of these pamphlets is that there exists uh, a secret society of learned, godly men uh, who live in a city of light uh, and where they comport one another, uh, where, where they comport themselves uh, honorably, where they spend their time learning, uh, exchanging information, uh, becoming, and, and in so doing, becoming essentially uh, uh, immortal uh, healers uh, who also come and live among the regular people, among, among the, the ignorant masses, and uh, can offer them healing treatments, can offer them enlightenment, basically, uh, and that they are seeking through their experimentation and through their works to bring about uh, a this 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 confrontation that we're talking about and that and and the uh, the emergence of a champion to sort of rid Europe of what was seen by the uh, Protestant uh, the Protestants of the, of the continent uh, as the superstitious tyranny uh, the the anti-christian, uh, uh, thuggery of, of the of the Antichrist in Rome, the the the, the Pope. Uh, they're sort of the uh, the Jedi uh, to the to the Jesuit Sith, uh, yes. and and uh, they promise essentially that if that they will eventually with their champion uh, overthrow uh, 
the Pope and bring about this enlightened age, which is, is, is a more secularized, sort of uh, nerdier version of the old vision of uh, Christ's return on earth. Uh, and they promised at one point uh, that when the day comes and, the, and this hidden city reveals itself and the champion uh, is, is crowned, that we promise more gold than both the Indies bring to the King of Spain. For Europe is with child and will bring forth a strong child who shall stand in need of a great godfather's gift. So, and there's a bunch of description of sigils, which are charged with this occult meaning that only the adept could understand and, and utilize. Uh, and the impact that this these pamphlets had on the situation can't really be totally uh, quantified, but we do know uh, that that they circulated in the uh, court of Frederick V of the Palatinate, who was the only Calvinist uh, elector of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, whose court in Heidelberg was the headquarters of, of, uh, of not just Calvinist uh, theology after uh, the death of uh, uh, Calvin sort of uh, saw uh, Geneva uh, in decline in, in that respect, uh, but also where free thinkers from across the continent came because at that point, uh, not at that point, uh, the Calvinists, because of their insistence on a separation of church and state, and churches not having sort of a say on civic uh, judicial questions, uh, seemed to be the place where free thought could could most be uh, uh, generated. And so you have all these people showing up uh, and living in this sort of a fantasy world honestly the the with these uh the the heidelberg court had these wonder rooms filled with these uh in, amazing contraptions powered by pneumatics and, and water wheels that had uh that, that created the the illusion of automatic motion uh and in that context this these uh papers appear which say there is a there is a, a lion amongst you who will come and who will redeem Europe uh, for not just Christ but for uh, not uh, reason as an expression of of God's will uh, and they they took it up on them they 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 decided let's do it and be heroes and uh, because uh, in retrospect and even at the time among people like you know John George of Saxony who was the preeminent Lutheran elector. Than the Holy Roman Empire, Frederick's decision to accept the crown of Bohemia when the Bohemian rebels offer it to him after the defenestration of Prague, where they chuck the uh, royal represent the imperial representatives out the window, uh, is seen as madness. Uh, but fortified by a, a, a one a, an idea that they had created a durable military and uh, diplomatic alliance with uh, the uh, the nascent Dutch Republic and with England. Uh, but also fortified by this this mystical understanding of their own place in the universe uh, and Rosicrucianisms, uh, the, the idea of these 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 Rosicrucians existing somewhere, uh, helping them, uh, endorsing their actions, uh, definitely uh, impacted that. And uh, in the years after the appearance of these pamphlets, there is sort of a Rosicrucian craze where people are starting to people who uh, read the books or read the pamphlets. Uh, and which which explicitly say, uh, do not come seeking us. Do not come and try to find the Rosicrucians. Uh, uh, they decide, well, okay, if they're not going to come to me, then I will come to them by embodying their ideas. And so people start creating their own little societies to uh, to pass information along each other and so to emulate the the model that the Rosicrucians. Uh, put in those pamphlets. And in France, for example, in the early 1620s, there's sort of a Rosicrucian panic. Uh, and uh, there's there's this fear amongst the Catholic uh, majority that, that, that there's that this, this subversive group is somewhere within their midst. Uh, there's an open question as to what degree, and uh, Francis Yates and Rosicrucian Enlightenment uh, suggest this, there's an open question uh, as to what degree the entire Rosicrucian thing was not in some respect, a uh, an intelligence operation uh, by uh, by the court of James the uh, First through John Dee, who was in Bohemia around the same time that the Rosicrucian books are being written. Uh, but there's no way of, of, of knowing that for sure. But uh, what we do know is that that, that the Rosicrucian uh, idea 
contributed to this sense of the moment that everyone was living in as the defining moment and reassured many people that uh, that patriots somewhere were in control, that there were uh, that there were great minds uh, greater and wiser than theirs uh, put to the task of bringing about this this universal enlightenment. Yeah. So uh, what I find fascinating about what you're talking about and about the Rosicrucians at this time, the Rosicrucian movement, I should back up, right? There probably wasn't a mystical order of Rosicrucians that, that produced these pamphlets. And as you said, there's all sorts of theories about where they came from, um, but they they gave birth to Rosicrucianism. It's, it's one of those inspiring things sometimes when you are in the realm of ideas, right? You know, there's, there's, there's th this idea out there, I, I don't have to do action. I can just create the magical ideas that will change the world. And in this case, you know, it, it actually did uh, have the, these real, real world effects. Now, listening to what, what you're talking about, it all sounds like pretty negative effects. It sounds like they were throwing a uh, gasoline on the fire at the time. But, you know, you mentioned Yeats's Rosicrucian Enlightenment, where, I, and I really love this idea, and I'm fascinated by, the, by this in general, right? About how, how the sword can be double-edged. Because the, the Rosicrucian pamphlets also led to lots of good things. Uh, like the uh, Royal society in England, right? The, the rise yeah. of science. The, 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 of course, the ideas about science are very different at the time, but the pamphlets talk about, you know, the importance of the sciences. Um, and the, uh, uh, the, the, this double-edged sword is uh, uh, something that, uh, I, I, you know, really, I, I can't, I can't get out of my head. But um, I want to back up a, a little bit. Um, you know, you mentioned in, in your preview for, for the show uh, how it's very Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. Uh, so you have, um, and, and, and folks, it's, it's more complicated than Game of Thrones. Like, you, oh, uh, yeah. Matt, Matt did a great job simplifying it, right? But, but you have all these, all these personalities and all these uh, big and large kingdoms, uh, and you got great names like the Winter King and the Winter Queen, who you mentioned. But I wonder if we can back up a little bit to, to Rudy too. Right, uh, yes. Rudolph II, who who kind of you know it, it, it's it's kind of all his fault, maybe. So can you tell us a little bit a little bit about him and you know how his his or pondering and his interest in, in Rosicrucianism and the esoteric was was perhaps uh, uh, not what the world needed at the time. Yeah. So R Rudolph the Second, as the uh, Holy Roman Emperor uh, uh, in the late seventeenth uh, late late sixteenth century. Uh, leading up to this this the crisis period, uh, and he's presiding over a uh, a Holy Roman Empire that is becoming functionally ungovernable. Uh, and there's the continued war uh, in Hungary with the Turks, which is the overriding foreign policy uh, uh, issue of the uh, Holy Roman Empire, which. And the fighting of which requires this constant negotiation with the restive electors, including the Protestant ones, in order to get money to to fight this war uh, with the Turks, which the uh, which the Protestant uh, electors have little interest in in helping with. Uh, they would much rather uh, leverage the situation to to uh, increase their own uh, power relative to the emperors, uh, and. As I said, like this, the idea of the empire as a uh, neutral arbiter of disputes has sort of gone by the wayside. And uh, in that context, uh, Rudolf basically kind of gives up on actually governing the empire. Uh, he moves the, he refuses to marry or even consider a, 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 a marriage or, or offspring that would secure like his line uh, of succession. He moves the court uh, uh, of the emperor from Vienna to Prague, and he then spends his time uh, living in a uh, occult fantasy realm, uh, surrounded by his uh, cabinet of curiosities and, and his collections of uh, of odd ephemera uh, and and uh, uh, sacred and uh, occult uh, and profane books, uh, with an idea perhaps that if if I cannot use the the the, the the terrestrial tools uh, at my disposal to actually govern. Perhaps there are uh, supernatural ones. Perhaps there are occult uh, secrets that could be unleashed to gain some sort of uh, control, some sort of sense of uh, legibility to the world that I find myself thrust into. Uh, and there's a quote that I uh, really like that was uh, 
his brother said about him, uh, one of his brothers, who he hated uh, and who was in a constant conflict with, uh, one of whom would eventually uh, leverage all of the discontent in the empire to overthrow him, essentially, to, to, gain, his, uh, uh, to gain his abdication. Uh, and it, one of his brothers said, his majesty is interested only in wizards, alchemists, cabalists, and the like sparing no expense to find all kinds of treasures, learn secrets, and use scandalous ways of harming his enemies. He also has a whole library of magic books. He strives all the time to eliminate God completely so that he may in future serve a different master. And when you see this and you see like the Rosicrucians, uh, there is this, this yearning for to transcend the limitations of the early modern world. Uh, and Looking back, we can see that the contours of a new world with new tools is already being built, but beyond any individual person's sight. And, and because this is before you know, the scientific revolution, before that vocabulary and, and world have been built, uh, the, the language of Kabbalah and alchemy is the only language that exists to express that, uh, that understanding, that feeling, and that yearning, uh, which... The things like the fighting of the Thirty Years' War and the the state building capacity that comes with it uh, is going to help unleash in the next uh, century after that. Yeah, um, I really like the the ideas about John D being being associated or being behind, and you know he's a great example of, of sometimes what you're talking about as well, right? Because he's he's making all these scientific breakthroughs and he's also talking to angels, right? Mm -hmm. He's, um, he has one foot in, in the heavens and he is literally doing, if not, if not this intelligence operation, he's running intelligence operations, right? Yeah. But at the same time, you know, going to the other world and doing all this holy stuff. Um, you mentioned that the Stuart co uh, court, right? Uh, the, there's legends in my family about being related to the royal stewards. We're not. We we just, you know, uh, raised sheep and had sex with them. So, uh, <laughs> but but I've always I've always been interested in the royal stewards because uh, of those legends. Um, and, and the royal stewards did have a role to play in sort of spreading esoterica around Europe. Uh, you know that that that's another topic. But that does bring us back to to Freddie Five and his uh, his wife. Uh, the uh, uh, Elizabeth Stuart. So, yes. can you tell us more about the Winter King and the Winter Queen? And, and again, like you already mentioned this, but but just like Rudolph, they, they sort of retreat and, and create this this. I think it, I think it would have been wonderful at the time, right? Like I would have been there, you know. Oh yeah, this, this fantasy realm, the uh, cut off from from the terrors that are outside. But you know, the, the thing about this fantasy realm is is like like Rudy the Second. They think this is going to fix everything, right? Like yeah. it, it's not it's not a complete retreat from the world. Like they think that that this is this this is going to be the answer. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. tell us more about them and why they're called the Winter King and the Winter Queen. Yeah. So uh, so. Uh, Frederick V was was uh, betrothed to uh, Elizabeth Stuart, the daughter of James I, uh, and they had an incredibly sumptuous, uh, dreamlike wedding in Lo in London with with the, the plays and, and, and fantastical devices and uh, it, it just uh, the entire and, and courts in London and then in Heidelberg surrounded by uh, filled with people who were insisting to both of them that they were special, that they were that they were marked for destiny, uh, and. They and once they get to once they proceed to Heidelberg and set up set up shop there, uh, they operate on the assumption on those assumptions and uh, uh, and Frederick's major domo Christian of Anhalt, uh, who uh, is his sort of strong right hand, uh, tries to make that manifest by care by doing a rigorous diplomatic outreach to the Protestant powers of Europe uh, to attempt to make. Uh, make pa the Palatine make make the make uh, the Palatinate in Germany the headquarters of this new uh, Protestant alliance that would defeat not just not just get better terms from the Catholic uh, uh, powers of Europe, but to overthrow them, to 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 bring down the Antichrist in in Rome, and to bring down the superstitions and the tyrannies of the of the scheming Jesuits, uh, and. Uh, Part of the reason they, they thought that is because they assumed that they were they had the uh, support of Elizabeth's father, uh, but unbeknownst to them, uh, James's uh, marriage of his daughter to uh, to Frederick was part of a broader strategy of peacekeeping, 
uh, James saw the James from England saw his uh, best position not as uh, the head of some holy war uh, uh, assembly, but rather as the pivot point between the confessional blocks, assuming the reality and the continuation of th this not trying to bring about the end of the world. Uh, and as a result, and so he was trying to marry his sons at the same time he married his daughter to Frederick. He was trying to marry his sons to the Habsburg, into the Habsburg families. Uh, he's trying to he dis disastrously. Uh, his his son Charles went to Spain to try to to get married, and it was a huge debacle. Uh, then eventually he married her to uh, one of the daughters of, of the French monarchy. There were uh, he was not interested in in uh, in a holy war and in, in apocalypse. Uh, but that that was something that was not dimly did not understood at all uh, in uh, Heidelberg, uh, and so they carry forth this. Uh, very risky decision to accept the bohemian crown go to prague and as soon as they do they find that they really don't have any of the friends they thought they did uh james is not happy at all about the decision he does give some money and allows troops to be raised in england to be sent there but there is no formal uh, uh help there uh the dutch are pretty busy at the time they can't really help too much uh and the lutheran princes are absolutely opposed because the lutherans at this point hate calvinists more than they hate catholics yeah. Uh, which is always how it goes, uh, because the Catholics, they're benighted. They're, they're, uh, they're brainwashed by, by their Jesuit masters. You should know better. What are you doing with this baloney? Uh, so they're basically alone. They, they, the army, they have to basically, the, the, the army that they're able to raise uh, is, is funded by the Duke of Savoy, uh, who's, who's, who's just doing it for, for like little finger gambo, uh, you know, uh, machination reasons. Uh, and they are, uh, military uh, efforts are pretty disastrous. Uh, and within a year, uh, they are driven out of Prague after the Battle of White Mountain, having ruled for one season, which is why uh, they get called the Winter King and the Winter Queen. Uh, and then the rest of their life is spent uh, kind of wandering the courts of Protestant Europe with a, their hat in their hand, trying to get people to, uh, to keep them in the style they've become accustomed and to fund their restoration uh, to their lands, which they, they never see. Uh, it's very, also when they are in Prague for that brief period, they actually, uh, almost immediately alienate the entire local population. Uh, they were brought, they come in as, as, as the saviors, but, uh, the, the people of Prague are not Calvinists. The people of Prague have a well-established Hussite church. Uh, they, they, they were really the first, uh, protesters from the Catholic uh, uh, hegemony to actually sustain their independence uh, with Jan Hus from a, cent a century before these events. Uh, and they have, and like, <clears throat> and the church they have, the Ultra Church, has a lot of the, the, the pomp, the iconography, uh, the ritual of Catholicism intact. Uh, and the, uh, the Calvinist court that comes with uh, Frederick, led by his court theologian Abraham Skultudis, uh, are horrified by this, and they 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 start knocking down stained glass windows and, and pulling uh, reliquaries out, and the local population is horrified by this. Uh, and, and also, uh, Frederick and Elizabeth are a little a little weird. The, 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 Frederick likes to uh, swim nude in the Vistula River, which which horrifies people, uh, and. That by the time uh, uh, Tilly shows up at White Mountain, they've kind of worn out their welcome, uh, which again just shows you know uh, how fast fantasy uh, can break apart once confronted uh, with the reality that it's trying to to trying so hard to replace, but without without the the effort to do so, with, with the, the assumption that there's this magical shortcut uh, to to breaking through, which can only ever be disabused by the the harsh uh, emergence of reality. Yeah, I really want to come back to that point, but I'm quickly going to do our Patreon commercial. Matt, don't be intimidated, but we have 44 patrons. So, <laughs> uh, hey, folks, if you'd like the show, you can support us for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that. I I've given the keys uh, uh, to the kingdom to our other host, Jason, as well. We're trying to pump out more content, but we're, we're only going to charge for four to six uh, pieces of media. So we're hoping to get a lot more out there. Uh, we don't put anything behind a paywall. We don't really give you anything for being a patron 
except uh, early access, which I've been a, a bit slow on, but, but I'm actually taking a bit of a break from the uh, the show. So I am banking a lot of shows. So you're, you're going to get a lot of content, probably a couple months worth. You could do uh, one-time donations at paypal.me slash Gnostic. Uh, if you don't have any money, don't give us any money. Just uh, tell people about the show. But, but we do have a, a, a Patreon goal, which is uh, me not starving to death this winter. Now, uh, Canada does have some some great social programs. My backup plan is one called Made. Just Google it. Uh, <laughs> Matt, uh, to, to, to sort of you, now your your series is not just about the 17th century, right? You are making connections. I, I mean, this is the birth of the modern world. Uh, some of this uh, is probably sounding familiar to to people now, like endless war, conspiracy theories, uh, uh, cloak and dagger stuff. But before we really dive into that utopianism. It's, it's something I think a lot about. Um, like, for instance, I, I thought that the world spirit was going to sweep out from Vermont and make some incremental changes to make the world slightly better. I, and, uh, and that didn't happen. And, and I noticed when that didn't happen, a lot of people who also thought that went completely bonkers, right? Yeah. So there is, you know, I, I, I've seen already, and, and you know, when I was a young man, I, I was involved with, with a number of sort of utopian groups, both, both religious and political. Is, is utopianism dangerous or do we need it? Because how else do we inspire people? How else do we get them moving? Like, you know, I am a, I am a big guy on this, this imagination stuff, right? This, this young uh, Alan Moore, uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, uh, even like the uh, the Neoplatonic uh, ph philosophers, like we need to to uh, we we need we need these stories, we need these myths, we need these narratives. So uh, yeah, what do you think about utopianism? Its uses, its dangers. Should it be abandoned? Uh, I absolutely agree that it is. Uh, it cannot be dispensed with. It is necessary. It's the engine of uh, of all of all meaningful uh, political act, I mean, if you do not have a utopian vision, what is what is the point? What are you seeking? Uh, but I, I it, 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 but it is also dangerous. And I would say that the, the dividing line for me is to is that all everyone has to have uh, a, a utopian horizon in their mind that they, you know, uh, in times of darkness can rotate in their head like a like a cube or whatever. Uh, but that they but what needs to happen what needs to be understood is that you are not going to see it. That it that it is not for you. Utopia is not for us. It's like Moses doesn't get to go to the promised land. You know, like you that is part of it. And I feel like the danger of utopianism is is that uh, implicit and explicit assumption and understanding overriding your actions to try to push it into being so that you can experience it, so that you personally can experience it but the but the thing is is that if it is real if 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 these notions if these ideas are real and i do believe they are uh then you should not have to see them in your lifetime their their their, 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 their existence transcends time uh and, and then you can live with them in your striving for them that is where it can live is in the striving for them uh, the, the the actual the actualization of this is in a world in a world to come like the the world really did end for these people in the 17th century and not just the ones who died in, in the horror but anyone who survived they were birthing a world that within a few generations would be uh in many fundamental ways un unrecognizable the, in a different psychic space a different world was born but without anyone's F, without anyone knowing that's what they were doing, without anyone seeking it, they were seeking everything else except for the thing that emerged, and that is always going to be the case. And we have to, I think, it is we to be responsible utopians. We have to accept that that whatever emerges uh, through our struggle and the struggles of people around us and people after us is going to be alien to us in a way that uh, means. It, while it might be utopia eventually, it will not be our utopia. It will not be one that is legible uh, to to our experience because we are living in like the the, the at, we are living at the end of a way of life, of an understanding of the world, of, of a of a heuristic uh, that is ex extinguishing itself, that is exhausting itself, uh, but and that will be will be replaced, uh, and that that is I think. 
one of the things that helps me uh, get away from the the the, uh, the doomer mindset and the, the idea of the 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 black pill uh, uh, nonsense is is there is the re- the black pill idea comes from the recognition that this way of life is ending, but th- then uh, that's just nihilism unless it's paired with an understanding that of course something will come after and it will be a development of what has come before it will emerge from but the people who are going to be struggling to build it uh, are going to be doing so in conditions that are totally uh unfathomable to us and unimaginable to us and that means that the the world they're going to build is going to have a uh uh truths embedded in it un, uh, unconscious assumptions about the nature of reality uh that that we would not be able to recognize if we saw them uh and, and that to, that to me is how to square the utopian circle to to keep a utopia in your heart and to try to seek to try to seek it in your life to try to find it through struggling towards it uh but always with the understanding that the actual thing uh, if it emerges, will be for others uh, in another time, uh, and that that's not bad. I, I think that 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 our um, our hostility to that idea, our rejection of that idea, comes from our our selfishness. It comes from our connection to the machine that we're you know trying to rail against. Like we we see its awfulness and we we seek to, to dismantle it. But we also are made by it, uh, and our desire to to make the utopia of our minds into the world around us, in the face of the reality that we find ourselves in, uh, is just a, it's it's that voice of of uh, of uh, Yelbanadoth. It's the it's the it's the Demiurge telling us, uh, no, it must be it must be me, it must be this consciousness, this conception, this world that is un removable from it because if it's me then it's this world because this world made me i am inextricably linked from it but to you have to acknowledge your own finitude your own uh uh your own mortality uh and the mortality of the system that birthed you uh if you're going to truly em- uh embrace the implications the radical implications of the utopian horizon yeah i uh, and i think that's a I- I mean, you're using some Gnostic language here, but I think that is one of the central metaphors of Gnosticism. Um, and yeah, the Alma Nerva flies at uh, dusk, people. <laughs> We're not going to know where, where it's going to land. Yeah. Uh, staying, staying with this topic of narrative. So the the, the first, I, I really like the, uh, the the first Rosicrucian Manifesto. Uh, the second one is just a Pope sucks. I, I don't find it that interesting. <laughs> uh, the third one is 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 a trippy dream sequence. It doesn't really have these, these political... The chemical- Marriage of Christian Rosenkreutz. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. It's it's great, right? I, I don't know what it means, but you can you yeah. can read it, you can decode <laughs> it, you can dream about it. It's uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It's an I Ching. It's it's a it's a it's a it's some sticks to throw and to look at and to and to in in the seeking of of order from that in the seeking of of coherence from it. It's going to reveal itself, uh, and and then the 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 truth of your observation comes from your application of it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, I think it's uh, constructed to work exactly like that, right? Yeah. So, with with this idea, like you know, you're someone who's been thinking a lot about uh, religion, spirituality, the last couple of years, uh, and staying on this topic of narrative, which is, you know, I'm also involved with with the mindfulness world, with the secular mindfulness world, and and sometimes, uh, please keep giving me money for doing that. Anybody who who are my clients, but sometimes. You know, I, I ponder and I wonder that we, we can't just sit people down and teach them how to do these spiritual technologies. We can't just tell them these spiritual morals. We're storytelling animals. And it seems that we need these narratives and myths to, to fully interact and understand, I shouldn't say understand, to fully interact with the mystery. So mm-hmm. like, you know, I, I guess my question is like, when you start your cult, are, are you going to have <laughs> a an origin story, right? Like, is there going to be aliens? Is there going to be a virgin birth? You know, I'm being facetious, but uh, like, what, what do you think 
about this? Like, do we do we need this narrative? Do we need this myth? Just like you're talking about uh, utopianism, if we want to explore the mystery of spirituality, the mystery of of religion, the the mystery of the bigger questions. Yeah, uh, I think you do. Uh, I, I I know that in my own mind, I can coming back to, because yeah, I, I I can, I I I try to resist the urge to narrativize, right? To just experience the, 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 the sensation and, and to, but you know, it, that, that, that moment is bracketed, you know, by narrative, it has to be. And so coming out of that experience, there is the instant narrativizing of it and the instant contextualizing of it. It's, you cannot avoid that. If you want to live among people and communicate with them and communicate with yourself, it is, it is, it's not optional. Uh, and uh, I, I certainly under I, I get the aliens. I get aliens as a, as as a, as a metaphor, and it's one that speaks to me as someone who you know showed up just too late in time for for the the uh, supernatural understanding of of religion, religious beings to to like uh, to like angels. You know, I, I can, you know John D would have been into aliens if he was born in the twentieth century. Absolutely. Uh, there, there's the, and so I'm stuck with I'm stuck with aliens, but uh, but not aliens as as time as uh, space travelers. To me, uh, 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 aliens as dim interdimensional emissaries. Machine elves, uh, huh? Machine elves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, or honestly, you know, uh, uh, humans. You know, from yeah. from a different Earth than ours that it exists you know in the same space as all things do you know it's uh, everything is next to each other it's all there is no uh real distance from consciousness like it's one field uh it's just you know our very select sliver of perception of it uh and you know so my mind often when i'm you know when i'm trying to come down and and uh and arrange my feelings about like the the, the sensations that i've had uh, it, it usually comes back to some narrative of of uh, of a people recognizably human to me, recognizably uh, uh, part of the human pageant that I know from history and from from uh, the world around me, uh, reaching a point uh, where technology uh, and humanity are are fused, not by uh, not to the will of of an algorithm and to the will of the machine, which is what we're building right now, yeah. uh, but where it, the, the mere technology is truly suborned to a human uh, will, not an individual will, which is what the people who are building this machine of death think they're doing. They think they're building something that they will be the enthroned lords of for eternity, but uh, that's what the devil tells you, you fucking idiots. Like that's that's the pitch of Satan. Is that yeah, you'll be you'll be right in hand. It'll be great. And then you find out no, you're 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 dying strapped to a gurney with a fucking Ethernet cord plugged into a, a MacBook. Uh, but 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 a a universal human consciousness that is networked through technology, and in so doing is able to break through, shatter the 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 uh shatter the bars of the black iron prison and 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 pass and allow for the transmission you know of of uh of knowledge through these uh membranes that to us appear completely uh impermeable yeah, no, it, exactly. And I say this on the show all the time, but you know, you're a podcaster. You, everybody ends up saying the same things all the time mm -hmm. because we, we have our pet theories and our uh, pet stock phrases. But the early Gnostics, they, they don't seem to quite have the language for it yet. But when they're describing the Demiurge and the Archons, it's it's a it's a machine intelligence. It's artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. Yes. And uh, there's a this scholar I really like, uh, Jonathan Kahana Bloom, Dr. Jonathan Kahana Bloom, who, who says that the Gnostics are are the first critical theorists and they're looking at a self-replicating 
systems, mm -hmm. right? The, the the system of empire that is on yes. the earth and, and how it acts like an artificial intelligence, how it acts like a god that that isn't a god. Mm -hmm. Um and I and now I think you know two thousand years later we, we now have the language to properly uh describe what they were talking about. Now that said I think the Gnostics the early Gnostics, I'm not going to say they were just critical theorists, right? They lived in a very different world from us. They, they thought that this was probably a reflection of some spiritual realities as well, right? I'm not going to say they were, you know, some sort of like atheist writing in code, right. but uh, these things probably worked on, on levels for them. So, mm -hmm. so, so the machine, Matthew, uh, to, to, to tie in what you're talking about, so why it might matter even more for people's lives, in this case, I mean your miniseries, uh, Hell on Earth, like the birth of the modern world and the birth of the market system how, do, how does this get like and i know this is the thesis and you probably have hours where you're explaining this but you know how does the market system come out of the 30 years war how, how... so uh by the 17th century you see across uh the across eurasia basically across that you know the jared diamond stretch where you have really intense uh uh uh, uh agricultural production uh, in these uh, hierarchical class societies that's able to generate significant surplus and lead to a real demographic boom. Uh, and in doing that, uh, it creates an unprecedented amount of technological innovation. Uh, but it is discrete. It is people in places making, a, uh, trying to adjust to their conditions, trying to survive uh, under the conditions of empire that, they, that are imposed upon them. Uh, but they are but they cannot uh, bring those uh, innovations together towards uh, a, a, a agreed upon goal. They're 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 held to discrete uh, purposes. Uh, and in places like uh, China, uh, the uh, central authority of the empire explicitly reduces the capacity of these innovations to uh, revolutionize to 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 create a new level of technological uh, uh, intensity uh, because of their ra incredibly destabilizing power because the machine does not care about the individual uh, rules of individual sovereigns or systems of, of human control. It is control itself. Yeah. It, it, the, the, who is uh, being, who is at the helm, who is, who is running the thing? Sorry. Oh. Who's running the thing is is trivial to them, uh, because it, it is it is yeah an inhuman consciousness, uh, uh, and so in places where you have a powerful uh, authority that is able to recognize this threat, that the 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 these market innovations are suppressed, uh, and in China specifically, you see the the most uh, in the seventeenth century specifically the. Uh, uh, the most effective merchants to emerge out of uh, this matrix leave. They become this diaspora that spreads throughout uh, throughout Asia uh, and becomes like a, a, a network of trade nodes there. But within China itself, uh, these innovations, uh, the economic, technological, are, are uh, re suppressed. In Europe, at the same period, where you have these medium-sized states in competition with each other, and no central authority overriding anyone. The closest you have is this Holy Roman Emperor, which has been declining in its actual effective authority since Charlemagne died, basically. Uh, and in that context, uh, all of these innovations are reluctantly, but eventually embraced by every sovereign, even though they undermine their long-term power because they serve their short-term interests of their conflict with the other dynasties. Uh, and this period, the 17th century, is when the uh, incredibly unstable social structure that, um, that uh, exists, which is uh, you have a market system emerging spontaneously in the cities of Europe, overlaid with a still fully feudal political structure, uh, and which has been under immense pressure and the cracks have started showing for a hundred years, the reformation being one of the significant cultural manifestations of this conflict between these two things, the marketized economy of the cities and a feudal, uh, structure, feudal political and social structure. Uh, 
they're already at like a terminal crisis, much like they were before the Black Death emerged in the third in the fourteenth century. And here, the accelerant that pushes things into conflagration and uh, eventually uh, the emergence of states like the Dutch Republic and England willing to wield all of these uh, developments along one specific line by empowering their middle class, their their uh, their merchant urban class, uh, is the Little Ice Age. Uh, it is this very rapid drop in uh, global temperatures that hits Europe especially hard uh, in the early to mid 17th century, uh, at, uh, a drop in a few decades of two and a half degrees, uh, which massively reduces uh, the agricultural output uh, of Europe, uh, which the entire system depended on and which led every power that be everywhere to frantically find any way uh, to maintain their power uh, in this crisis condition. And the only way that they could is by empowering uh, this new market economy. Uh, and specifically, uh, the country, the Dutch and the English are able to do that, specific because they are the most marginal at the time. And it's the marginality that pushes them in that direction. Like it, the, fa the fact that England was in the Middle Ages sort of a, a backwater of Europe, a, just a, a sheep or a wool exporting monoculture uh, is one of the, the main reasons that they become the, the, the hearth of capitalism is because they have a motivation to seek an advancement to prevent being annihilated by their opponents. Uh, that more secure, uh, more fertile polities can't, don't have. Uh, and it's that motivation that pushes them uh, to to bring together all of these innovations that emerge in places like you know, the, the Italian city-states of the, of the medieval era and, and the German cities uh, of the Holy Roman Empire and, and, and the Dutch Republic and bring them together to a package uh, that is able to compete uh, and out-compete uh, the, the still sort of hybridized feudal systems that the rest of the continent still has. Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes I, I get some angry emails. You, you know, we, we are sponsored by a Gnostic church. We, we can't, uh, you know, uh, tell people to to vote for a, uh, a specific politicians, parties, agitate for any specific politics. But we, we, I, I think regardless of where you are on the political spectrum, uh, you're probably getting a lot out of what, what Matthew is talking about. And I think now, uh, both on the left and the right, particularly the more mainstream cultural left and right, there's this real idea that we're being ground up and being spit out of the machine, right? You may have some different definitions of what the machine is, but it, it does seem to be a common idea right now. So I'm just, I'm just doing that little song and dance. We're talking about 17th century people uh, before I, when I talk about the, the two C words. But uh, this isn't a fully fleshed out idea. I think I'm going to write a paper on it. I'll send it to you. The, uh, the, the, we don't get, okay, so Yakov Burma, uh, we don't get Yakov Burma without, the, without Rosicrucianism and the 30 year war, right? So mm -hmm. he, he's very influenced by the Rosicrucian uh, manifestos. He's very influenced by the utopian ideas that are floating around. He sees the chaos of the 30 years war, and he believes that is going to end in the age of the lily and in, in the utopianism. So we don't get his output without that. Without Yakov Burma, we don't get Hegel and dialectics. And without Hegel and dialectics, we don't get Marx and dialectical materialism. So we see both the birth of, I, I would propose, capitalism and communism at this time. Mm -hmm. But, but, but uh, this is sort of embarrassing. So as I've mentioned before, and I know everybody out there is shocked, they, they see my youthful face and, and how hip and cool I am, and they're like, this, 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 this young guy, he's bussing. But I, I, I am, I am middle-aged, and, and, you know, lately I've been getting into that sort of like Zizek, uh, Todd McGowan, uh, Lacan uh, bullshit, right? Which yeah. is usually something that, that undergrads get into. And, and Matt, I, I, I'm asking you to free associate, talk about psychoanalysis. Uh, maybe, maybe you won't have an answer uh, for this, but for a long time we've known that there's there's strong connections between between Protestantism and the market system and the way we act now right mm -hmm. so uh, for instance you know when you're to work is godly in, in under Calvinism mm -hmm. and a lot of people who are quote unquote no longer religious they they uh, they feel guilty when they're not working all the time, right? So there's a great yeah. example. But, you know, I, I propose that it goes deeper, that, that we have a, a religious relationship 
to the market system in an even deeper way, which is the, the commodity form. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it is. We have a religious relationship specifically to the commodity form. Absolutely. Even Mark Marx talks about this. Yeah. So it's not it's not the greatest of insights. But I, I suspect that it is tied up with Protestantism. And I suspect that it its origins are here. Right. In the 30 years war. So mm -hmm. like why? The, what do you think the link is between this chaos, Protestantism and our, our perhaps unconscious religious relationship to the commodity form? Do, do you have any speculation about that? Yeah. Uh, the 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 the, <clears throat> the Protestant Reformation to me is in part a psychological uh, recognition that the marketized world that people were living in. Uh, could not sustain the uh, god of of, uh, of feudalism, who was a god uh, of ritual, who was a, who was a public god, a god affirmed by every structure of of existence, the the, the church, the, the 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 princes, the everyone was on the same page about a god who was manifest in things like the the Eucharist, like you you get enough Christians in a room together and God shows up in a piece of bread, like that. That what could be sustained in in feudalism at the pace, the rural pace of feudal life, but the rapidly increased speed and of life, the increased uh, necessity of treating if you're going to be a, a merchant, if you're going to live uh, 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 in the market, an increased need to treat others as strangers, as as aliens to you, not as brothers in Christ. Like you, they might be theoretically, but that you cannot treat them that way or else you lose your shirt. So you have to treat them as strangers. You have to treat them as people who you can take advantage of, which is something that medieval church understood was deeply uh, undermining to their authority. That's why they said, no, let the Jews do that. Let, let Jews lend money. And then once in a while, if there's a bad enough harvest, we'll go and kill some of them and feel better about ourselves. And we get to keep our understanding of God and we get to keep the real presence of the Eucharist. Uh, and the, the necessity of, of this marketized society uh, to, to take advantage means that you, you can't live that way anymore, which means you get enough Christians in a room together and God is gone. God, the, the, the bread is just bread now. Uh, the, and if that's the case, where does God go? And God goes into your mind. God, God becomes functionally you. Yeah. That's the thing, is that... God is a projection of your own mind. The, the, the social God of, Christ, of, of medieval Catholicism is, is replicated in social ritual. It is something beyond you. It is something that is, uh, that is more than you and has to be. Something that is a mystery. That's why you don't ask the question of, well, oh, wait a minute, how's the God in this, uh, this way for what? You're saying if a dog eats it, that that's God? Those kind of questions don't emerge because... The totality of life pushes them out. They, they would not occur, but it is the isolation. It is the solitude of, of, of market life that, that banishes that idea, that, that, that banishes our social faith and demands a rational and a reasoned understanding of God, uh, which then becomes the fixation of these people. It's, it's very like you look at Luther and Calvin. They thought, I believe both of them believed, that if people got the notion of grace, and it, 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 they would then not worry about God. They wouldn't worry. The, the, the burden would be released. They would be able to act again as, as uh, brothers in Christ because they would know that they were saved. But if you're living isolated, if you're living in uh, competition, if you are living... The, this new life in this new sterile market world, uh, then all you end up thinking is how much, how much, how unworthy you are of salvation. That becomes the only thing you can think about. And so God is just your conscience, basically. God is the, 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 the echoing voice of a world uh, that is gone uh, and, and that you cannot return to. Uh, and so the market becomes the place where you try to keep that voice at bay. Uh, and uh, Calvinism specifically uh, becomes a way to replace uh, the comfort uh, of salvation that came from living 
in a universal church because in medieval Catholicism, basically nobody thought they were going to hell. Yeah. Their, hell is for witches and Jews. You go to purgatory, it doesn't sound great, but hey, if you, if you have enough friends and family, if you live your life well enough, they're going to be throwing, they're going to be paying priests to do services for you. They're going to be getting, yeah. uh, getting, uh, they're going to look at uh, the Pope's fingernail. That they're going to get you out. They're going to spring you. It's a chain of responsibility that you're part of. I'll get my grandpa out, out, out and he'll get me out and my kids will get me out and I get to go to heaven. That's gone. There is just the saved and the damned who can never be redeemed, who can never be uh, bought out. No intercession will say. Uh, and who can that be? If, if you accept predestination at the logic, the ironclad logic of Calvinism, uh, then how can you know? And the only answer becomes those who God favors in life. And God's favors are bestowed by the market. Yeah. And yeah. so that's the world we still live in. And like the most secular liberal in America who has no, never believed in God for a minute of his life, who, who for, for like by the time he was six, is like, God, uh, me thinks not, still operates from that under, assumption, from that belief. Because yeah. if this is the only world, then then advancing within it and getting the world's uh, uh, benefits, uh, get, uh, advancing in the market, succeeding through work is the only value. It still is. It's just, uh, but there is this other side, like uh, uh, this moment, the, the Reformation and the time that comes later creates, you know, uh, this Calvinist morality that, that becomes the mindset of capitalism to this day, but it also creates the Anabaptists it also creates this idea of, oh, uh, if we are all, you know, if, if there is a, um, a priesthood of believers, then we actually can treat one another as believers. But that comes in conflict with the social order as is, with the class system as is. Uh, and that is why I think you really do have to look at the emergence of uh, socialism in the 19th century as the secularized continuation of that that note which starts with the gnostics that yes. goes through all of christianity which runs which is created by uh christianity as a uh, artifact of class rule but which uh challenges it and which tries to uh overcome it and that's been the struggle throughout throughout european and now human history once the, the universalization of capitalism happens uh, and and it and it now I think is the, like the global dream of uh, of emancipation. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, you know I, that that's a perfect point to to start wrapping up. Uh, I, I forgot to talk about Michael Mayer. We we did a show on him, but he was in the quarter route off the second and basically uh, drove himself insane looking for the Rosicrucians. But he was mm. a fast, fascinating man who created uh, some fascinating texts. Uh, a closing question, uh, Matt. You know, so uh, you're you're you guest on a lot of podcasts. You're active on Twitter. So you know, your reply guys and uh, podcast podcast hosts, they're always trying to to riff with you and and, and your fellow chapos. So my closing question is, which of the hosts of Chapel Trap House is most likely to be Mark David Chapman by one of your one of your reply guys? Uh, Felix, hundred yeah, percent. I mean, absolutely. I'm number two. Yeah. Uh, but Felix is definitely number one. Uh, because and it's precisely because of that riff question. We already have an alarming number of people who have essentially become supervillains because they did not get sufficient uh, recognition from Felix for their his replies. So uh, it stands to reason that one of those is going to finally tip over the edge, and he's uh, yeah he's going to be his slave in the afterlife. Absolutely. Okay, so it's Hell on Earth. Uh, it's patreon.com slash Chapo Trap House. We are recording this. You know, things live online forever. We're recording this in December uh, 2022. It's going to be available January 2023. Uh, definitely check that out. You know, there's a good chance that this is the only episode of this of this show that you'll ever listen to or watch. But, you know, check out some of the others. Matt was on another one. You might like some. Uh, if you're interested in Gnosticism, uh, my church does have a uh, free course. It's joeandite.com org slash learn uh, and uh you know we're high church liturgical gnosticism so you you can do your trad stuff about becoming a fascist yeah, the free course does kind of sound a little scientology but it's 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 an online course it's fun it's great uh, check it out there's no uh, e-meter 
Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, we we, we will send you a free e meter. Um, and uh, you know, that's uh, that's it. Thanks again, Matt. Thank you. Okay, bye everyone.